en, uh, en interpretación es el símbolo de globo en la parte baja de la ventana de Zoom. Y allí puede hacer clic en español y si no quiere escuchar la sesión en inglés, haga clic en silenciar audio original. If anybody um, needs help with interpretation services, si necesita ayuda para acceder a la interpretación, puede preguntar en el chat y mi colega Iram le puede ayudar. So before we begin, I'm going to share a couple notes about navigating the Zoom space. First, as I already mentioned, if you need support with interpretation or with captions, you can ask in the chat and my colleague Iram will gladly assist you. Second, feel free to share your questions for the panelists at any point during the event using either the Q&A button or the chat. And we'll collect your questions and try to address as many of them as possible during the Q&A section of the event at 2.30 or around 2.30 p.m. Lastly, please note that we are recording this event. Your name will not be visible in the recording, but your video might. I would encourage you to keep your video on because I think it helps contribute to a sense of togetherness, uh, but we also completely understand if you are more comfortable with your video off. Uh, before I pass it over to the co-principal investigators of this project at the university, I want to share a little bit about the panelists. So today you're going to hear from representatives of three organizations who have been part of the Reclaiming the Border Narrative initiative which is a project that aims to challenge harmful uh, and reductive narratives about the US-Mexico borderlands and about migration. Our role here at the University of Arizona is to support over 48 artists, cultural practitioners, activists, human rights organizations, and journalists in building a digital archive of the cultural assets that they have been producing over the last few years. Today, you're gonna to get a comparative view of the cultural and community organizing work being done across the borderlands from the Rio Grande Valley to Baja California. As most of us here I'm sure know, our borderlands communities are not monolithic. These organizations have different focuses, are in different geographic regions, and have unique perspectives on border and migration issues. Nonetheless, all three of them are using culture, art, and storytelling to empower their communities, to resist oppression, create change, and to thrive. From Mexico to Palestine, culture, including art, literature, and music, has always played a fundamental role in social justice movements and in revolutionary movements. So I'm personally really excited for this conversation, and I hope that you all enjoy it and are inspired by it. Now I'd like to pass the mic to a uh, professor of Latin American and Border Studies and director of the Confluence Center, Dr. Javier Duran. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome everyone. Bienvenides. Buenas tardes. Um, we would like first to acknowledge the financial and administrative guidance and support of the Ford Foundation. Uh, we're especially thankful to Margaret Morton, Director of Creativity and Free Expression, Lane Harrow and Rosie Aranda. Our thanks to our University of Arizona colleagues and the Reclaiming the Border Narrative Archival team who have worked hard to make this event possible, especially Michelle Ceballos and Lorena Diaz. Um, as a Canadian Punjabi activist, scholar, and community organizer, Harsha Walia writes in her 2021 book, Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the, race, the Rise of Racist Nationalism, borders function through four primary, primary modes of governance beyond walls, exclusion, territorial diffusion, commodified inclusion, and discursive control. Walia suggests that borders are not fixed or static lines. They are productive regimes concurrently generated by and producing social relations of dominance. In addition to migration being a consequence of empire, capitalism, climate catastrophe, and oppressive hierarchies, contemporary migration is itself a mode of global governance, capital accumulation, and gender racial class formation. If we agree that the local border narratives have been appropriated, mass mediatized, and altered by several political and economic interests, 
The border is thus represented in a constant state of chaos and crisis, feeding into an object imaginary of criminalization and dehumanization of its inhabitants. This is in fact how discursive control operates in the region, representing it as a sort of political piñata used to implement anti-immigrant policies that exacerbate racism and xenophobia, especially during election times. And these are the forces that community-based organizations grapple with to maintain their social, cultural, and historical existence. This communal response to oppressive hierarchies and varied degrees of structural violence represents a great deal of the work encapsulated in many of the participants of the Reclaiming the Border Narrative initiative. Reclaiming the Border Narrative uh, facilitates immigrant rights advocates um, artists, journalists, writers, and community-based organizations to shape and preserve stories reflecting the dignity and truth of border communities, connecting and empowering them to center the narrative on their own terms and in their own voices. There are 48 grantees, as Michelle mentioned, from five major partners in this effort, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, Borealis Philanthropy, and the Center for Cultural Power. The University of Arizona Conference Center for Creative Inquiry and the University of Arizona Library Special Collection serve an important role as the archival partner. In the first Frontieri Forum, I referred to Gabe Solis' notion of archive, archives of survival and how they can actively interrupt cycles of violence and trauma and help distressed communities reclaim and build new empowering strategies. The work, this work gravitates around collective care inquiry, collaboration, resistance, and resilience, which are fundamental pieces of community organizing. A key element of these actions, Solis reminds us, is their moral architecture and their centering in community and care. This moral architecture has been a key element in the development of this archival project, as our work seeks to elevate regional stories and perspectives and to highlight matters of racial justice, gender equality, and the evolution of these voices within the unique cultural context of the borderlands. Our role is to ensure that the stories and materials generated by the project grantees are digitally preserved, widely accessible to the public, and activated through public programming, such as this, our second Frontier Forum. We see the archive as a dynamic and generative space a site of ongoing dialogue, intersections, and creativity that will be connected to academia and to our partners cross-disciplinary border programming, community outreach activities, curricular content, and research opportunities. Again, I want to welcome you all to this event, and now I would like my colleague and co-PI, Veronica Reyes Escudero, to say a few words. Gracias. Adelante, Veronica. Buenas tardes desde Tucson. Eh, qué placer poder estar aquí con ustedes. Agrego mis gracias a todos ustedes por estar aquí con nosotros, especialmente a los participantes del archivo. I'd like to add my gratitude to, of course, our funders, the Ford Foundation, for their guidance and support, um, as well as for all of you joining us um, in our second Fronteri Forums. To those participating in the discussion today and to our team who thoughtfully organized and designed this event with fantastic speakers. I'll share with you that during our first Fronteri Forum, I was at a conference devoted to special collections and archives professionals of which I am a part. The question of too much vocation in the, voc in the profession has come up as many uh, were facing near or full on burnout following these years of pandemic, racial reckoning, and interweaving of our personal and work lives with what seems uh, like a little rest. The work that the Ford Foundation Initiative is facilitating absolutely takes vocation. Community organizing absolutely takes commitment. It is all inspiring what all of you have created and I know that to do so takes an enormous amount of vocation and dedication even when it blurs the lines in our lives. But yes, let's take a deep breath and take a moment to recognize that the work we do sometimes blurs both figurative and literal lines of life, work, geography, tragedy and joy, celebration and advocacy, and yes, sometimes even life and death. In my brief remarks, 
I want to shed light in the significance and profound impact of archives. The Borderlands collections of the University of Arizona Library Special Collections help to shape the experiences of border and migrant communities. Archives serve as invaluable repositories of historical records, documents, and narratives that not only chronicle the past, but also hold the power to shape our present and future. They offer a glimpse into the complex tapestry of human interactions, revealing the multifaceted dynamics of borders and the experiences of those who live alongside it and traverse them. What is especially significant and special about this project is that many of us on the archival team, and certainly most of you, know and live this geographic space well and understand that it is so much more than that geographic line and what the media depicts. We were so proud when the Ford Foundation recognized our work on amplifying border narratives when they chose us as the archival partner for this initiative. The Digital Archive will play a pivotal role in preserving the stories, joy, and struggles of migrant communities. These records capture and live um, the lived experiences of individuals who have embarked on perilous journeys in search of safety, better opportunities, or reunification with their families. They document the hardship, resilience, and triumphs of those who have traversed borders, leaving behind their homes and familiar surroundings. By safeguarding these narratives, archives honor the dignity and resilience of migrants, ensuring that their voices are not only not lost, but are indeed amplified. It is our hope that the archive will further provide opportunity for learning, affirmation for our students, and perhaps crucial evidence of advocacy and policymaking efforts aimed at providing the lives of border and migrant communities. Archival collections of uh, documents, testimonies, and data are instrumental and enable researchers, scholars, and activists to analyze historical patterns, identify systemic issues, and propose informed solutions. Archives empower communities and advocates by providing them with the necessary stories and tools to challenge harmful narratives, dismantle stereotypes, and promote inclusive and compassionate policies that uphold human rights and dignity. Additionally, as Dr. Duran mentioned, archives foster a sense of collective memory and cultural preservation. They serve as repositories of cultural heritage traditions and identify capturing the richness and diversity of humanity. Through the preservation of oral histories, photographs, artwork, and other materials, archives contribute to the recognition and celebration of the cultural contributions of migrants and their communities. By preserving these invaluable records, archives reinforce a sense of humanity and belonging and foster intergenerational connections, bridging the past with the present and the future. Lastly, archives as evidentiary materials have the potential to facilitate healing and reconciliation processes within our communities. They provide spaces for individuals and communities to reflect on their shared history, acknowledge past injustices, and forge paths towards reconciliation. By creating opportunities for dialogue like this one and more to come, archives enable diverse voices to be heard, fostering empathy and understanding across cultural, social, and political divides. They contribute to building bridges of solidarity, amplifying marginalized narratives, and nurturing collective efforts for a more just and inclusive society. Archives hold an immense importance and wield a profound impact on border and migrant communities. They serve as guardians of collective memory, instruments of advocacy, catalysts for policy change and agents of healing and reconciliation. As we navigate the complexities of borders and migration, let us recognize the vital role of archives and commit to their preservation, accessibility, and amplification. The digital archive moves us to that end. Thank you to the Ford Foundation again for their vision and, and for recognizing and entrusting the University of Arizona as the archival partner to this important initiative. By doing so, we honor humanity and dignity in all uh, of all individuals, fostering a more inclusive and compassionate world for future generations. So yes, this work, all of our work does indeed take vocation. Thank you. I would like now to pass it on to our colleague Yadira Caballero to share our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, 
Shea Ya, Yadira Caballero Yanishia, the Program Manager, Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry, Dan A. Wolf, Wolf, Al Shanaz Nishado. Look at the no Nishlo, Nakai Bushish Chin, Nash Ejitova, E. Dashache, Ado Nakai Dashanele, Ado Nana, Bidast Eat, Sekot Ayesi Nasha, Kwe Tusan De Kesh. Ado diet al the nest than initially. A de Bilagana bizarre yasht hit. My clan introduction usually is the first introduction when you are connecting yourself to an audience. It is a formal and it is a way of introduction to the earth, universe, and where you come from. So it is more of a spiritual spiritual introduction because it connects myself in four different ways with Mother Earth through my clans, with my mother, my father, maternal grandfather, and my paternal grandfather. As a Diné person, we have an interwoven relationship with eh, kinship. We observe how the land is interconnected with all living beings together. All is related and everything in every place has a role and has a responsibility. Like many of us here today on the call, we are coming from a place where we can relate to the connection of a place, the role who we are, the stories and traditions that were brought down to us. So here, this is where I say many of us today are joining from different places. Where I am currently located, I am a guest on the native homelands of the Tanatha Nation and the lands of the Pascoyaki tribe they are the ones whose care and keeping of these lands allows us to be here today. It is a place in relation to the original people of the land and they will continue to carry their traditions and cultures. I welcome you all to let us know in the chat what traditional lands you currently reside on. So here I will transition now to pass it to our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Gonzalez. De Bustamante. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Yarida, for that beautiful land acknowledgement. It is such a huge honor to be here with all of you. And I just want to say, sort of like coming home, uh, even though it's sort of in a virtual sense. And I, it's a tremendous honor to be here with you. So I think. Um, Veronica Reyes Escudero, the head of Special Collections, and Javier Duran, director of the Confluence Center and co-principal investigators on this project, for uh, inviting me to moderate this, this panel. We're all very familiar with the dominant narratives that persist about the Mexico-U.S. borderlands, but as has some others have said, borders are spaces of innovation, creativity, joy, and beauty, and as I was hearing others talk, it made me flash back to uh, my times at um, Ambos Nogales. And after 2016, when there was another tremendous buildup along that border and how there was razor ribbon included and added on to that border. But then when I went back a few months later, I saw how these beautiful plants had started to take over the wall and that razor ribbon and how the the nature itself was beautifying this space and in their own way i believe that the panelists who you're going to hear from today are beautifying the space along the u.s mexico border and you'll hear more about what they're doing in just a few moments so I also wanted to, before I introduce them, I wanted to also uh, thank Michelle Ceballos and the entire UA Libraries and Confluence Center team to, for doing such a tremendous job in getting this event going. I am Celeste Gonzalez de Bustamante. I'm an Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in the Moody College of Communication and the, at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm also a professor in the School of Journalism and Media there. Um, and prior to coming to UT, I served as the director of the Center for Border and Global Journalism at the University of Arizona School of Journalism for many years. And I've also conducted research in the US-Mexico borderlands 
and worked as a journalist covering the borderlands. And during my time as a journalist and as an academic, helping to change the borderlands narratives has been really at the front and center of what I've done and continue to do as a professor and now as an associate dean. But you're here to hear here to hear more about uh, the U.S.-Mexico borderlands from our esteemed panelists. So I'm going to begin to introduce them now. First, we have uh, Josue Ramirez. He uses he, him pronouns, and he is a multidisciplinary artist and advocate practicing in the Rio Grande Valley. He is a co-founder of Trucha and serves as the managing director of the organization. He oversees the Trucha's uh, operational needs, including strategy, fundraising, and engagement. And Ramirez was the RGV co-director for Texas Housers and a program coordinator at Come Dream, Come Build. His artwork work has been featured in Minge Museum, Mexarte, Art League Houston, and The Craft in America. Next, we have Michelle Carrion, who is a food justice storyteller at La Semilla. She holds a PhD in the interdisciplinary field of American studies and is a self-described archive geek committed to narrative change through storytelling. Established in 2010, La Semilla Food Center is a nonprofit organization based in Anthony, New Mexico. La Semilla works to foster a healthy, self-reliant, fair, and sustainable food system in the Paso del Norte region of southern New Mexico and El Paso, Texas. La Semilla is committed to building strong relationships and creating empowering spaces for youth and families to grow and cook good food, create positive change, and foster connections among food, health, and local economies. They do this through six vibrant community-centered and land-based programs. And then we have Sara Soto, who is the financial director and co-founder of Espacio Migrante, a binational community organization based in Tijuana, Baja California, which works with migrant communities to promote access to human rights, such as education and health. Espacio Migrante provides comprehensive care and at the same time raises awareness in the community about the realities of migrants. Espacio Migrante has a shelter for migrant families, as well as a cultural and community center where migrants living in Tijuana can participate in community activities, educational programs, cultural events, and health and legal services. And welcome to all of you wonderful panelists. So now I'm going to turn the mic over to the panelists who will tell us a little bit more about their work. And we are going to start with Josue. Josue, take it away. Awesome. Well, hello, hello. ¿Cómo andamos? <laughs> I hope everyone's doing good. Uh, thank you for having me. My name's uh, Josue Ramirez coming here from unceded Estocna land in the southernmost tip of the U.S.-Mexico border along the uh, Rio Grande Valley, what we call the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so growing up along the frontera, like many of you will probably did, we grew up with a lot of colorful sayings. But one of my favorite sayings is Ponte Trucha. Ponte Trucha basically translates to uh, be aware of your surroundings, to understand what's going on, you know, not to get caught slipping, basically stay woke. And so we saw this as a call to action, basically thinking, what if uh, we were all Trucha for our community? And so with that in mind, Trucha uh, was funded and started. And uh, here today, next. So we all know living in the in the border what the problems are when it comes to the representation of our community through the mainstream media and the way that our experiences along the frontera are spoken about and talked about. Um, and so historically, you've been victimized, you know, called by colonization, by extraction, by capitalism, uh, you name it, we probably <laughs> faced it. And the problem does not end there. I mean, it continues, right? Every, it seems like every day there's always something um, that we are having to resist against. And so um, really what we understood that is when um, this became, the US-Mexico border was targeted uh, by the federal administration, right? To uh, basically 
uh, dictating the land and the region as a, a place that needed to be addressed. And so we saw how our communities were framed and uh, a group of us decided to uh, take control of our narrative and to do so um, specifically by centering creativity and storytellers. And so um, that is partly why Trucha is here. We're a multimedia organization dedicated to the people, the culture, and the progressive grassroots movements of the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, again, we lit, are in the southernmost tip of the Texas-Mexico border. Next. And that's where we're at. So if you've heard about the RGV, you've probably heard the saying, Puro 956. Uh, and so that's uh, our motto. But basically, who Trucha is making work for um, is for dreamers, for organizers, families, for working class uh, neighborhoods here in the Valley. The majority of our uh, audience are uh, Latinx individuals, primarily Mexican and Mexican-American. And the region is about four-fifths uh, bilingual, either in English and Spanish. And Trucha's work particularly um, has an audience that's largely millennial women and men, and then Generation Z uh, women and men as well. Um, and so, the, that's who we make work for and who we prioritize, primarily um, immigrant communities and uh, LGBTQ folks um, are who we make work for. Next. And so the vision behind uh, how we how we create our cultural narrative really relies on three story or three pillars of storytelling, um, and that's really so we can create uh, the infrastructure that is needed so we can proudly share our stories with you know the world. Um, many border communities are con consistently disenfranchised. And so a lot of the creative infrastructure needed to make this a reality is oftentimes missing. And so we are working at a deficit, um, but really our goal is to fill the regions that, that need, right? For the media infrastructure, um, for independent, Progressive news throughout um, our community. Um, in the Valley, we don't even have an NPR station or PBS station. And so there really is a large gap for the way that media is shared um, and <clears throat> the way that arts and culture are also leveraged for um, our benefit. And so that's what Lucha focuses on. Next. And so, as I was saying, a large portion of our work uh, focuses on community-based journalism. We really believe that everybody has the power to tell their own story. And in order to combat the breaking news cycle that the border is often subjected to, we really uh, prioritize people's experience and working with people who might not be uh, journalists, but who have something to say about their community. And so we feature the voices of local citizens, community advocates, grassroots organizations, basically to tell the stories that matter to them. And most of them re revolve around issues of immigration, race, reproductive justice, and other community and uh, cultural events as well. Uh, a large part of our work, one third, um, is some of the work that we publish on our website, which is where we get all our information now, is submitted by people in our community. And most recently, we started a fellowship program called the Pluma Libre uh, Fellowship, where we train uh, a cohort of community-based journalism journalists on what community-based journalism is about, and we provide more feedback in their development as storytellers. And so we've uh, submitted uh, a lot of stories. These are some of the stories that have gotten the most impact um, from our readers. Um, so anything from history that's not taught in school, we all know what's going on with book bans and the anti-DEI um, work that's happening. Um, and then anything re that revolves around uh, ra class, race, and gender, right? Um, our audience are primarily women. And so things like uh, the femicides in the Rio Grande Valley, which is largely not talked about, are of course of importance to them. And then anything regarding SpaceX and the ecological um, destruction of our region by cap space capitalists, as you all may know, um, SpaceX 
has their launch facility in the Boca Chica Beach, which is located here in the re in Brownsville, Texas. And so a large uh, people are very interested in what's being said to counter the narratives and the myths that are being placed in our community by literally the face of capitalism, right? The largest, per <laughs> the richest person in the world. And so those are some of the issues that uh, we focus on in our community-based journalism program. Um, next. Um, we're a multimedia organization, and so we really use videography as a way to capture not only our experiences um, and actions that might be going on, but to get more in-depth understanding of who uh, who's doing the work, who are the artists, what is of interest to them, and also uh, just as a tool for and a medium for storytelling and creativity. And so we really highlight and uplift um, our community through documentary shorts, through live coverage of events, through long form collaborations. And so, so far we've published probably that's um, needs to be updated, but uh, around 50 plus videos um, that are usually paired with our uh, journalism work. So, and they include issues around immigration, Latinx culture, everything from TikTok shorts to a long form documentary on conjunto music, which is uh, born right here in the Rio Grande Valley uh, and uh, a historic tool for telling stories in the community. And so that's the videography work that we do. Um, but thank you. Next. And this is an example of the work that uh, we do with our cultural organizing, but also an example of how we use our documentary video videography to, to tell those stories. So we can watch this video or part of it. <laughs> A Roots Break Walls developed into a campaign, a series of events around these explorations. We had three and they focused on different themes that we've also carried like throughout the narrative. So uh, there's like the theme of interdependence with ourselves, with our communities, with nature. The mere idea of like going outside and like being aware of those surroundings, whether it be like the clouds look pretty or the sky or the air feels nice. I think those are just like small ways that we can um, start connecting with nature again. We got to kind of explore like the interconnection between nature and culture and us and roots. And just the way roots um, spread out and help plants grow. Uh, our families are the same way too, right? Um, leaving home and finding new homes for us to grow and prosper, whether it's with careers or like lifestyle. And I feel like a lot of us here in the valley have experienced that some way or another through our parents, our grandparents, or relatives beforehand, or even us ourselves when we leave and come back. You know, we come back and replant ourselves in the valley to keep our roots growing in our community. So the, the so that's an example of how we utilize our videography to uh, feed the not only the cultural work that we're doing, but uh, the the actions, right? The uh, events, the conversations that we're trying to have with people. And so um, that's a great example of our cultural work, which is the next part of it. So next. So in terms of our creative programming, um, Trucha uh, works primarily with two purposes. One is to create that infrastructure that's missing um, for artists to thrive locally in an equitable fashion. And secondly, it's to connect those artists to the grassroots organizations and movements that are doing the work on the ground, right? And to so they can learn uh, what their role is in movement building and to connect to that. And so um, we that takes place through a variety of methods. Um, primarily, one way that we've done it is through artist residencies. Um, so the Blooming Feels Weird is an example of a ceramic residency that we held uh, around a socially uh, connected topic, this being around uh, body positivity and queer experience. We've also held solo exhibitions in conjunction with museums uh, locally. Uh, for example, the Jesse Burciaga is a wonderful border artist uh, who created a social called Aquí Descansaba with the San Benito Cultural Heritage Museum. And it was in regards to his uh, personal experience and uh, losing his brother along the border. And so the um, 
the exhibition was really a part of a grieving process and a coping process for, for that experience. Uh, and then we have uh, the Roots Break Walls campaign, which is more of an example of um, the a campaign or artivism, which really is a long form um, work, but it's a series of, of conversations that we want to have with our community that take um, place through events. And so the Roots Break Walls, what we really wanted to explore was the connection between immigration and the natural landscape and the idea uh, of roots and plants also being able to migrate, right? Uh, you know, we think of them as still, but in reality, those plants got there through air, through water, through animals, uh, plants also migrate. And so it's a very much a part of the natural world. And so just connecting that and having those conversations is part of what we were doing. Um, but that's really the um, what we focus on our creative programming. Um, some of our more current work, which is, I think, featured in the next slide, um, is in regards to using, um, like I said, videography and doing cultural events, um, not just in our border community, but throughout different border communities. So, so this Mida Media Festival is all about exploring the, the experimental. And thanks to the Border Narratives Fund, we were able to fund the first one. And two years later, we're now launching the second iteration, which actually has open calls for submissions. So you're free to, uh, what do you call it, scan that. And basically, it's an experimental festival that centers uh, border communities and experimental art, which is something that doesn't really get a lot of play in border communities and in general. Um, and so we think that there's a lot of uh, worth in, um, you know, centering the marginalized, whether it be in art forms or in just conversations like the border. Um, and so this festival is open to um, all international borders. So people from all over the world can submit their experimental art. And we're hosting um, two in-person events in uh, Harlingen, Texas, and in Laredo, Texas, in conjunction with some amazing organizations. But I hope that was a, a good summary um, of what we do at Trucha. And all of this is really has been made possible partly because of the border narrative work, um, which when the pandemic happened, there was a lot of uncertainty and the funding really allowed us to uh, use it for whatever was necessary and for her surviving and not only for her surviving but for really planning and thinking of how we wanted to live uh post pandemic or you know while that was happening and and we're so happy to to be here now but um thank you for your time and I'm looking forward to the conversation thank you so much Josue um, and felicidades on all your tremendous work and now we're going to turn things over to uh, Michelle Garrion from La Semilla. Hi, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm always super paranoid about not being heard on these Zoom calls all these years later. Um, I just wanna say thank you again for everyone who's in attendance, but also the staff and everybody who's made this happen. I'm really grateful to be on this panel with the other panelists and everybody. Um, so I'll just dive into it. Um, so our mission at La Semilla uh, Food Center is, which was mentioned before, to foster a healthy, self-reliant, fair, and sustainable food system in the Paso del Norte region, which encompasses southern New Mexico, where we're based, as well as El Paso, Texas, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico, and all rural areas in between, or communities in between. Grounded in agroecological principles that really center the Chihuahuan desert ecosystem, as well as a root cause approach to food justice, we are committed to building strong relationships and creating empowering spaces for youth and families to grow and cook good food, create positive change, and foster connections among food, health, and local economies. Um, as was mentioned before, we do this through six vibrant community-centered and land-based uh, programs, which are our community farm, our Farm Fresh program, edible education, community education, policy, and storytelling. I also wanna mention that our administration also is very connected to the work we do and, and kind of our structure and our framework. And I never wanna exclude them <laughs> from the programs as well because they're so central to our work. Um, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. So at Las Samia, we practice storytelling to craft intentional narratives that uplift community dignity and local knowledge, as well as promote equity and justice in our organization, 
our region, and also the national food system. We approach both storytelling and the documentation of local and honest history with respect and knowledge um, and acknowledge that these practices are a long-term learning process and it's an evolution of narrative change work. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So since our inception um, in 2010, La Samia has been engaging in storytelling and cultural work. I think that's really a given in the work that we do. Culture is always going to be central to how we organize, how we live in terms of just being human beings and being in connection with the land. But the support from NALAC and the Ford Foundation really helped lay the foundation and solidify our storytelling program, uh, which actually included the creation of my position. We hadn't had a food justice storyteller before, so I'm really blessed to be the first one. Um, and so through our project um, with this funding titled Soil Beneath the Border, Frontera Voices and Networks of Support, we have really seeded critical initiatives as a part of our regional foodways organizing and narrative changing efforts. Um, if you could go to this next slide, that'd be great. So this includes the launch and promotion of our Farm Bill zine, Food, Land and Us, a look at the Farm Bill from the Paso del Norte region, which is a graphic novel highlighting the history and community impact of US agricultural policy. Importantly, it's told from our region. It's actually from a character in Vado, New Mexico. We think it's really important in creating this work to tell it from our communities so that, you know, especially the youth that are reading these materials and learning about policy, that they're seeing themselves in their communities represented. Um, so this zine really was a project that had been in the uh, progress for two plus years, I believe. And it's interesting because it started out, uh, I know the idea was for some sort of pamphlet, like a small zine. Now it's, I think, 40 plus pages long and it's an actual graphic novel. So in August of 2021, we were able to host um, a live virtual release with a panel, including the authors who are current and former uh, La Simia staff, um, the illustrator who has been a long time like, partner, collaborator, local artist um, who was originally from this region. And also on the panel, uh, important food justice leaders organizing outside of our region too. Uh, the zine is available in both English and Spanish on our website um, as a readable PDF on our storytelling page, but also in the form of digital and printed copies, again, in English and Spanish um, for purchase at our web shop um, at a sliding scale cost. We really, you know, donation, um, really what other, whatever folks can afford at that point are willing to contribute. We're really big on getting this out there as a resource. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the funds also supported our Snapshots of Resilience initiative through which we gathered regional food waste stories really at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and collaborated with three local artists to translate these stories into multiple media products including the two murals that you see here on the slide, and as well as a forthcoming uh, short documentary film, which we're really excited to release that when it's ready to, to put out there. Um, we also released a report in March of 2022 that details the impact of COVID-19 on local foodways in the Paso de Norte region based on the stories that we gathered. And really, I, from what I recollect, um, the folks that were involved were community members that really run the gamut from farmers, uh, you know, gardeners, chefs, um, all kinds of folks representing the different segments of our food system in our communities. Um, and this report is also available on our website um, at our storytelling page, I believe. Um, if you can move to the next slide. So last but definitely not least, this funding also supported the launch of the first cohort of our Chihuahuan Desert Cultural Fellowship which is a hybrid effort of direct support, regional organizing and storytelling that funds cultural pract practitioners working at the intersections of border, borders, gender, and Chihuahuan desert native plants, foods, and wildlife. Um, cohorts have included such a diverse group and I've been really blessed to be so involved that I get to meet and work with all these folks, um, included visual artists, chefs, writers, poets, musicians, local historians, researchers. Um, it's been really amazing to just see, like for lack of better word, the diversity of, of each of these cohorts. And right now we're currently um, underway, our fourth cohort um, is underway with 10 fellows at the, at the moment. 
And as part of the storytelling component of this fellowship, we have been posting um, features and guest posts on our blog, um, written by staff, as well as guest you know, writers and fellows themselves. And we've also been posting and sharing videos on our YouTube channel, created by staff profiling the different fellows um, and other forms of videos as well, and cultural products by, products by the fellows themselves. So it's just been, you know, working on this presentation, it's been interesting to reflect and really see how much work we've done and how much we've developed, you know, these connections. And it's been uh, really, really incredible for lack of a better word. Um, so since launching and nurturing these initiatives, we've really witnessed the value of, as well as the need um, for supporting the diverse knowledge and community-based cultural, environmental, and food waste practices and traditions across our region, as well as uplifting community stories that are often untold, undervalued, and at times intentionally erased. Uh, we've, we've seen increased numbers of applicants and interest with each cohort of our cultural fellowship, and I kind of had that reaction because being one of those staff that receives those uh, applications, we've seen those numbers just go up every time we've put out the call for this fellowship. And again, to me, it really just shows not just the need for the support, but how many folks in our region are doing this incredible work. Um, and importantly, through this work, uh, a growing number of BIPOC uh, QT plus practitioners have been supported, but also importantly, compensated uh, through stipends and contracts working on various projects with La Semilla. We've also been able to expand our regional network significantly, um, leading to increased and deepened connections with each other, as well as with the Chihuahuan Desert ecosystem. And then furthermore, in, the, in this work that we're doing, we've really developed a growing insight into how we document and preserve histories collective memory, lived experiences, and practices around food waste as an organization. Um, in the storytelling program, which is myself and our director, so there's only two of us in the program, but I, I know I could speak for her and say that we're both really self-proclaimed archive and history. And we relish that. <laughs> we're committed to respectful approaches to archiving local histories. Um, we're also exploring different strategies and increasing for, for increasing accessibility and different ways of communicating, especially on our digital platforms. So we really are continuing to be more cognizant and to learn about how to make our website more in our online content more accessible in terms of both you know language, in terms of and, and so forth. So it's definitely a process. And like I said, it really feels like an evolution. It's just going to continue um, as we go. Um, in closing, a big question that we come, came away with from this project, which is a really long question, but I think it's important nevertheless, <laughs> is how do we move forward with creating community-based archives and supporting the ongoing documentation and preservation of our stories, our local knowledge and practices in a way that is respectful to our communities um, importantly, I think that's transformative in addressing misconceptions about the border, as well as misconceptions about um, the desert uh, biosystems and bioregions. And last but not least, that is truly accessible to all. And so um, thanks again, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Michelle, and congratulations on all your tremendous work. Uh, we are now going to shift to the Tijuana, Baja California, part of the Mexico-US border and turn things over to Sandra, uh, Sara Soto, Sara. Hi, thank you Celeste. And I want to congratulate Josue and Michelle for the amazing work that you do. Well, Espacio Migrante um, is a binational organization based in Tijuana. We work with migrant communities in Tijuana and also we have a shelter for migrant families and uh, cultural and community center for migrants living in Tijuana so they can participate in, in the um, activities that we organize. Next. So a little bit of the context of migration in Tijuana. Um, well, Tijuana is um, a migrant city. It's been always a, a city of migrants, but since we started the work in Espacio Migrante, we saw a lot of changes in migration flows. For example, 10, 12 years ago, 
we mostly work with um, deportees. And since 2016, that changed in, in Tijuana because we received um, a big flow of um, Haitian community in Tijuana. And in 2016, we received the Central American caravans. So that have been changing a lot. And um, right now we we have um, receiving migration from Mexico, from, from uh, Mexico, especially people fleeing narco violence um, in their communities. And for example, also we receive uh, Central and South American um, migrants from the Caribbean, from Haiti, from Africa, and most recently from Middle East and other countries. And something that ha hasn't changed since we started this work is that we see that um, migrants face discrimination, criminalization, and racism. Um, this is from the authorities, such as the migration agents, the policy, now the National Guard, and the Mexican army, but also for this, uh, from the society in general. And we have seen a lot of uh, changes in immigration policies that is affecting the, the migrant population living in Tijuana. For example, in 2019, we had the Migrant Protection Protocol, also known as Remain in Mexico, that made um, asylum seekers wait in Tijuana their asylum process. And a few months ago, well, during the pandemic, we had the Title 42 and re most recently Title 8. And right now, for example, uh, people has they have to um to fill up uh, to download uh, an application in their phone, the CBP one application, in order to get the their appointment to CBP uh, with CBP. So it's it's really complicated right now. And we also we have seen that the response of the U.S. and Mexican governments to these massive groups of migrants arriving to Tijuana or to Mexico. It is um, by increasing the military presence um, and uh, and at times violence. So along all the uh, along all the border, but also in both sides of the border. Um, and we have seen also that the Mexican government is cooperating with the U.S. government in order to contain migration. So the, they detain um, migrants before they can even apply for asylum. Next, <laughs> thank you. So we've been working toward changing the, the narrative about migration also through um, the community and cultural activities, but also through a joyful resistance. Right, next. And um, well, we, we do have the shelter and the community center and we, we do know your rights workshops and other activities, uh, advocacy. But also we think that through art and through the culture and our traditions, it's also a way to change it, the narrative. And one of these initiatives are the cooking workshops, the Mi Paisa Tu Mesa from My Country to Your Table, which basically is a, um, a space where the migrant community can share um, a recipe from their country. And, and this is not only to share it, but it's also, uh, also to create a dialogue with the community and Yes, to see the differences between each culture, but also in these differences, we find a lot of sim similar similarities and um, and things that unite us. And for example, we can see a bandeja paisa from Colombia, um, um, a rice fufu from Ghana, a fried chicken from Haiti, pupusas from El Salvador, pollo con tajadas from Honduras. So even in this, Cooking, we find some some similarities in in our cultures and in also the way that we we like to eat or what we eat. Next, um, and another project is the telenovela comunitaria, maestra veterinaria astronauta, teacher veterinarian astronaut, and this um this this project uh, or. This telenovela um, tells the story of a Salvadorian woman with her daughter migrating to Tijuana in order to be in a safer place. And when they're here in Tijuana, they, they face a lot of challenges when they try to access to education for her daughter. So the idea is um, to show the struggle and the challenges that the migrant community um, faces 
but also to show uh, um, that the migrant community has rights in Mexico and a way in how to access to these rights. And you can, uh, right now I will present um, the trailer of the telenovela. Cuando sea grande, voy a ser maestra, veterinaria, astronauta. Hay niñas y niños que caminan unas cuadras para ir a la escuela. Otros recorren 5 kilómetros en auto Y hay quienes recorren 20 kilómetros en bus. Maleska, no te preocupes, mi amor. Ahora sí vas a ir a la escuela, ¿ok? Vámonos, ya quitaron el retén de la Guardia Nacional. Vámonos, vámonos. Tenemos una hora para cruzarlo antes de que haya el segundo turno. Súbense, ¡Vámonos! Súbense, ¡Vámonos, vámonos! So, this is the, the trailer we, uh, a few, uh, a month ago, we presented the telenovela, uh, all the complete telenovela. So we hope we can, um, later we can, um, um, I don't know, present the telenovela in other, in other spaces. But um, basically this is a project that took us more than two years to, to, to produce, to edit and, and other things. And the idea of this project is, is is to to as I mentioned to create awareness about the the challenges that mig the migrants face, and also in, in that telenovela we also wanted to to show the diversity of migrant population living in Tijuana. Um, next, thank you. And another initiative are the um, community murals. As you can see, this is one of the the biggest murals that we have. This is uh, outside of Espacio Migrantes Shelter and Community Center. And this, this mural was made by a local artist, but uh, what we wanted to do with this mural is, is that, is to, to, to represent the migrant community. You can see families, you can see pets, you can see uh, African women, you can see students, you can see, for example, um, food and um, musical instruments. And the idea is to represent what the, the, the migrant community means to Tijuana. Um, next, you can, uh, well, and we have two, uh, three more murals. Um, one, one of the mural that is located in a, in, in, in a street in, in close to the shelter, but also the other two murals are in the community center of, of, um, of Espacio Migrante. And this is, um, community work too. Um, next. Um, another way to that, um, it, it, that we try to, um, well, um, to make um, our voices heard or to raise our voices about what the injustice that migrants experience in, in Tijuana is to organize and also to attend rallies and protests. Yeah, but it's also a way for us to to make a little noise and, and to um like to be seen in 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 in, in or the, the to be yes like to be seen i don't know if that makes sense but that's that's why we want or uh, or why we do participate in in this kind of events and uh, next 
And the last but not least are the cultural events that we organize. One of these events is Miradas Fronterizas. Um, Miradas Fronterizas um, is uh, an event where the objective is to show the diversity and the richness that the migrant community provides to Tijuana and also uh, to create a space that the migrant community can connect with the community in Tijuana, the community in San Diego. It's a space for music, for dance, for, for food. Um, and, and it's really the, uh, diverse. And, and this is one of the most and biggest, uh, the most important and the biggest event that we have. Next. And this year we're having our 10th um, edition. Uh, the, the, event, the event will take place in Tijuana uh, on December 1st and 2nd. You are all invited. If you happen to be in Tijuana or San Diego or Los Angeles, or if you want to fly from Arizona, Tijuana, that would be great. You are all invited. Um, and I just want to end um, my presentation as saying that Miradas Fronterizas is, for us, is like the best example of a joyful resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sara. Again, just such inspiring work and muchas felicidades a ustedes también. Uh, many congratulations to you. Let's move now into the dialogue portion of our event. I wanted to ask the three panelists to give us a little bit of personal sense of how you got attached to this work. What is what does reclaiming the border, border narrative mean to you and why is it personally important um, to be part of this reclaiming of the narrative? And maybe we could start with Josue. Put me on the spot. Uh, yeah, no. So, I mean, personally for myself, I think reclaiming my narrative as an artist, um, I mean, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I started uh, making art primarily through graffiti, <laughs> street art. And so um, it took a while for myself to uh, to step into my role and my experience as an artist. And I think that's not <clears throat> uh, something that is just myself. I think that many artists in the Rio and creatives along the frontera, along uh, in the Rio Grande Valley particularly, don't see artistry as a uh, part of, of, of their experience or something that uh, they can pursue and so and I think this is because of systemic disenfranchisement right and like that the fact that we can't see other artists uh living life uh, and living life uh, not struggling <laughs> and so for me it was uh understanding that uh, this is you know the situation but that that doesn't define myself and my artistry and that's the same as you know in in all aspects of life but for myself as an artist I really and a storyteller it was um, reclaiming that uh, within me. And then once I understood that, it was like, well, you know, why can't we all <laughs> in the real, why do we all have to be struggling? There needs to be um, that creative infrastructure that allows for these, um, for people to to reclaim their artistic practice and their storytelling ability. And, and that's why I'm very driven to, to the work currently. Thank you. How about you, Michelle and Sarah? Um, I think atta like attaching the personal and really thinking about that is hard sometimes because just in my role, um, I don't really talk about my own personal connections as much as, you know, being a storyteller and doing communications for organization. But for me, I think it just comes back to, you know, stories and storytelling just being at the core of my experiences my entire life. I mean, from being very little and really thirsting for the stories of my family, because even at that age, I felt that connection that I literally wouldn't be where I am without those who came before me, but also re remembering that in so many different ways. Um, I think the reclaiming aspect, um, like I said, from my childhood through every position or job I've had from my research to working at the public library and interacting with community members in a local history and archives context, the reclaiming for me is really just remembering, understanding, and acknowledging that our stories really matter, our histories matter. I think a lot of us have grown up in spaces and educational systems where we're, you know, in a lot of ways we're told that our stories are, don't matter and they're not connected to these broader histories we're supposed to 
know by heart in terms of dates and these big, you know, historical shifts. So I don't know if that answers the question, but like I said, I think reflecting on it just for me it reflects just that what's at my core, but also understanding what we're up against and that need for reclaiming in ways that I think are really important, but also just, I don't know. I, I don't know if I make sense right now. I think it gets very emotional <laughs> sometimes thinking about these things, um, especially the folks I've, I've, you know, come across all my life, but in a sense, reclaiming for me is also resisting that erasure and, and kind of that stifling in my stories. It totally makes sense. Thank you so much. And how about for you, Sada? Well, I think um, for us, well, the, the, the border is um, like a role, a very important role. However, it's always like the, the, the mainstream media often tells that migration stories are only about from or are from only a point of um, crisis, violence and fear. And um, the idea is also to talk about what is really happening? No, I, I mean, there's crisis, of course, there's a lot of uh, things that are happening, but there's not only fear and crisis and insecurity, it's a lot of things. And the, the reclaiming their narrative for us is, is, is to show exactly what the my, migrant community provides to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the city, especially in Tijuana. And that is not always stories about um, violence and crime and everything like that because when you think in Tijuana and you watch the news you only think about in Tijuana uh, like a very dangerous city and it is but there's no, there's not only that and these stories are not being told or these stories are yes it, the, the, the this side of migration it's not being told in the, in the mainstream mainstream media so that's why it's very important for us to reclaim this narrative and to change it. Yes, um, and I do a little. <laughs> oh, and I think that all of you are are doing that in your own different ways and um, important ways. So I just wanted to remind folks who are in the Zoom that we will have an opportunity in a little bit to have some Q&A from members of the audience. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A function using the Q&A function or putting them in the, in the chat. And so moving on to an, a next question here, I wondered if you could talk about some of the reactions that you've had from your communities and people you've interacted with, what have been the, what has been the response in your communities to some of the work that you've been doing? And maybe we could start this time with Michelle. Reflecting on this today in terms of like the responses and really it's been overwhelmingly positive in my experience. I think for some of the work that we've done, we've put out, we've also been really mindful of kind of the context we're living in, um, very heated, you know, conversations and a lot of, and you know, in terms of especially, um, you know, educational curriculum and kind of stifling and banning and, you know, there's a lot to be said there. Something that comes to mind in terms of, you know, contending with the potential responses of the farm bill zine. Um, I know when we were preparing to release that in, in 2021, we, we thought really intentionally about what kind of negative responses we could get. So I know we, we made an effort in terms of preparing language for potential comments on our social media or emails. Um, thankfully, and being someone who's in the communications kind of area, I really hadn't didn't see anything come through, but we wanted to be mindful of that and also protect um, the folks that had created the work. So I know we we learned a lot about, um, you know, kind of procedure, protocol, and precautions for anti-doxing and all that kind of stuff. But like I said, it's been mostly positive. Um, I just did also want to share within that same project um, what immediately came to mind in terms of responses. Um, I think it was either later that year or the following year, I was on a call with our, race, our Raisa's youth program, which ranges from mostly teenage youth um, in early 20s. And on that particular evening for that meeting, they were talking about the farm bill zine and they had read it and they were talking about the graphic novel. And I remember just being very moved by these youth from different areas within our region and um, our communities, how much it meant for them to see 
themselves in that graphic novel and to learn, you know, about policy and how the farm bill operates and all of that. But it's just something that came to mind in terms of that very real, tangible impact um, in terms of storytelling and really how our youth, you know, read these these products. So. Thank you. What about for Espacio Migrante, Sara, what have been some of the responses? Well, a lot of people are often surprised. Um, for example, uh, me as a Mexican woman that I was, uh, I was born and raised in Tijuana. And for many years, I didn't know that Tijuana was a, a migrant city. So like me, a lot, of, a lot of people still don't know what, what is happening in the reality because we live in like a, the, this privilege bubble so it's a there's a lot uh, a lack of um accurate information about what is happening so people often they they watch the news they they and what they hear about migration is that migration is complicated there is dangerous and they feel afraid and often uh fear leads to hate so that's when we see these um, responses, like very aggressive responses towards the migrant community. And so, but it's much, it's much more complex than that. And with our work, we look to change the narrative of migration so people can, can understand and see that, as I mentioned, there's crisis, yes, but it's not a crisis uh, created by the migrants. It's by, because of the lack of access to their basic human rights, because uh, of the inhumane policies in the US and Mexican governments. And and there's not a reason to, to be afraid of migrants. Thank you. How about uh, for your project, Trucha Josue, what has been the community response? I mean, overwhelmingly great. Um, what do you call it? Uh, we came to fruition, came to being um, through the, um, the through this grant, and so um, we've really seen a large growth in the folks who we engage with um, online, and then the folks who are submitting work to us to publish. Um, and so we have a consistent um, interest from people who want to tell their own story. And then, as far as um, the work that we're putting out, I mean, we're uh, getting a lot of folks reading very um, important uh, important issues that wouldn't be covered, uh, you know, and definitely aren't covered in depth in the other media landscape here in the in the valley. And so I think folks, um, and we're getting um, we're growing into that um, space where people really see us as a trusted. Uh, space for information, a trusted space for community more than anything, really. And um, I think um, that doesn't come without, you know, folks um, who have opinions about the work that we do. Um, I mean, what do you call it? We, for example, we're, we're always popping or looking into where we pop up and a place that we found was, um, you know, um, more right wing folks kind of like putting out the alarm of like, this is Trucha, um, what do you call it there? This is the kind of work they're focusing specifically, like when we're talking about like anti-policing, anti-militarization of the border. Um, and we're not afraid to talk about issues like that. Um, and we've definitely, I guess, <laughs> uh, sounded the alarm uh, in in the the sphere where they don't really want to hear about that or they don't want folks to hear about that stuff and so um, just being aware that um, our message is being heard and that we're being noticed not only by our community but by folks who don't want folks to to hear that kind of information is also kind of like uh, um, well we know that people are reading our stuff and seeing the work and so that's really important for us. Thank you. Yes, from a journalism perspective, it's it's always interesting when you hear from the critics because at least you know that your work is getting visibility. So there's there's that side of it. Um, I wondered if I could shift gears a little bit and talk about um, Espacio Migrante, Sara. You mentioned that your slogan is uh, Resistir Gozando. So resist joyful resistance. I wondered if you could expand uh, on that idea of joyful resistance and how that comes into the work that you're doing and maybe others as well. Maybe that relates to 
your your projects and your the personal sort of um, your personal connections to the work. So Sara. So um, thank you, Celeste. Well, Resistir was under for us uh, very important because we do humanitarian work and that includes, as I mentioned, um, having the shelter, know your rights workshops. Uh, we do advocacy too. But um, the idea of Resistir Gozando, it's like, even though the system, and we see with all the injustice, uh, the system is made to oppress people, to oppress us, um, um, to, to create crisis and to make people feel down or angry or sad. It's uh, one of the best ways to, like, to resist the system or to beat the system is by enjoying life like what we do, enjoying our work. And um, we do resist when we fight, but we also resist when we dance, when we share, when we preserve our, our cultures, our traditions. So this is what it means to us. That's great. Michelle and Josue, did you want to chime in uh, on that question of uh, resistir gozando, joyful resistance? Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, we're a multidisciplinary, multimedia organization, so we really don't believe in siloing, like, our experiences either to, like, you know, creativity, to, like, facts, to, like, uh, just living, and so that's primarily a purpose of why we do this, because we we just want to live the way we do and want that to be seen as valid. And so whatever way we choose to express ourselves, I think is something that we believe in and that we want to uplift. And a lot of it doesn't revolve around our pain or our uh, trauma. A lot of it is really um, just celebrating our family, celebrating our roots in our region and, um, and then, and also just, you know, being rowdy and like um, having fun while causing good trouble, right? And and understanding that that is like uh, Sarah said, like a way to sticking it to these systems that are trying to oppress us is really by showing um, not only that uh, we dismiss, dismissing that, you know, in a way for a, se for a second or for a couple minutes and just like really being in, in the moment with folks and be it at our events or being um, with the writers and journalists who are submitting work or the people who are filming, um, that that's very much valid. And so I think an example of this would be like the Media Media Fest. I mean, that's experimental art, right? And even within the art realm, I think the experimental uh, is often, you know, pushed aside as not seeing as worthy. And so, but we love that because it's fun <laughs> because it's, you know, and so the Media Media Festival was made with that purpose of like, you know, there's so much more to tell than um, the border narratives that were being fed. And there's also a variety of ways to do it. And experimentation uh, really lends ourselves to breaking away from these preconceived notions of like how we're supposed to tell our stories. And so, yeah. Thank you. How about for you, Michelle? Um, this is such a great like discussion, but <laughs> and just, that phrase and thinking about joyful resistance, honestly, when I think about that, like all these memories and scenes kind of flash from every single program um, at La Semilla in terms of my, my, just my own experiences. Um, and something that I think a lot about in terms of that joyful resistance is just the humor. I think that's just flows throughout La Semilla in terms of our different programs. I think for, for all three of our organizations, you know, we're all operating within very difficult, you know, systems, you know, of oppression and definitely the food system is very connected to that, as well as, you know, contending with farming in the desert and with climate disruption. Um, but again, what comes to mind in terms of joy is really humor. And there's so many different examples I can think of being in conversations with my coworkers and how laughter is really a part of everything that we do in terms of just contending with things, but also I think a lot of us just have an awesome sense of humor and relating to each other. And I'm thinking back to when I first started at La Semilla, um, our director told me I was going through um, a really difficult time personally, and I had asked about visiting our farm and just kind of connecting with the space, um, what was growing there, including a lot of native desert plants. 
And I remember she told me that um, our farm has really held a lot of tears over the past plus, you know, decade plus of organization. But I'm also reminded that our farm and the land has really held a lot of our laughter. And I know that sounds super romantic, but it's really true <laughs> in terms, of, I think, of our experiences. So that's what came to mind when reflecting on, on that phrase. And I just really appreciate Sarah, uh, Sarah sharing that with us. Yeah. Thank you for that. So uh, let's get at you with you, Michelle. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was access. And of course, archiving is one of the ways to do that. I, I'm wondering if you could speak to the question of how archiving fits into the broader project of reclaiming the border narrative and how that connects to maybe access. If you, if you would like to talk about that, please. Um, in terms of our organization or just more broadly or... In terms of La Semilla, yes. You had mentioned access and, um, and yeah. the archiving aspect of the, the reclaiming the border narratives and archiving what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, in terms of when we were approached about having this opportunity to archive with the University of Arizona, like that's the immediate you know, thought that came to mind in terms of you know, who's, gonna, who's the audience for this archive, who's going to have access to that. Um, what we end up donating. And we've been very intentional in terms of even just going through the process and deciding what we want to share, how we want to share it, making sure that we're, you know, getting consent from everybody, you know, that's either pictured or bought a part of the process. So I think in terms of we're still kind of in that process of how we want to, you know, ideally create our own archive eventually in some form at Last Me as an organization. Um, not just in terms of the folks that we work with in the community. Um, and obviously, like I mentioned, the cultural fellowship and other cultural practitioners that we're collaborating with, but also, you know, thinking about how we're preserving the histories and the, you know, different kinds of programs within our organization as as well. Um, and I think for for me, what really informs, at least from my, you know, my role in the organization in terms of how we document histories and make archives archives accessible is just having for the past number of years, you know, kind of been navigating these different areas of being in academia, you know, briefly in terms of going through a doctoral program in a university and then spending four years working at the public library within an archive section, which were very different in terms of accessibility. Whereas at the library, I think there was a lot more openness to that. Um, so to be perfectly honest with you, I think the best way for me to respond is just we're still kind of going through developing what that really looks like. And as long as I think we maintain our commitment to the values of true accessibility, what that looks like, um, telling honest history and making sure that community dignity is always kind of at the forefront of those decisions, I think everything else will will just kind of follow. And then, of course, you know, navigating the technology aspect and how to make um, archives accessible in terms of within a digital divide, in terms of various other barriers. Again, I'm not sure if that answered. I feel like we're so like still in that, you know, evolving process, but that's what's, yeah, kind of marinating. Sounds good. Yes. Um, it's in a, a lot of this is an evolving process, as you mentioned. So Josue, what about you? Uh, how important is the archiving side of what you're doing and how that relates, how does that relate to reclaiming the border narrative from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, from an artist perspective, I think, it, I mean, it's huge, you know, making uh, sure that your work and your piece of conversation in a time and space is preserved and taken into account is, uh, you know, not an opportunity that a lot of artists don't get. And so um, being able to provide that opportunity for artists who did, um, who we did engage with is I think something that we, you know, have never encountered. And then also the opportunity to archive, not just um, the artwork or, you know, the, the product, but the, um, telling of like how we got to there and maybe uh, more details that, you know, wouldn't be shared necessarily through just the picture or the image um, is super great. And I think it's just a matter of um, making sure that uh, 
that that information is there directly from the source, right? Um, and hopefully in the future, if needed, that those resources will be there um, and that there won't be more digging or more retelling of our experiences, but that they can really hear it from the horse's mouth, right? And um, and that it can be that and not a, a remaking of our experiences. So really having a more direct line to the future and to future conversations, I think is a huge um, benefit to this process. Thank you. How about for you, Sana? Thank you, Celeste. Well, I have to agree with Michelle. Uh, we, for us, it's always an uh, evolving process. So we're trying to figure out what, what it works for us and how, how to, to manage this archiving process. But I think it's, uh, for us, it's a way to preserve the work that we have done during all these years. But most important is um, to highlight and to show uh, the work that the migrant community has done. Um, our work is always, um, we, we try to, put, uh, um, to do our work based in what the community, migrant community needs, or, or, and we put always their voice in the center. So they guide uh, all of our work. So for us, preserving this is also to, to shine light the work that they have been doing um, in, in collaboration with, with Espacio Migrante. And as I mentioned also um, earlier, well, we, we often see news about migration um, in a point of view that is always crisis, violence, and fear. And this is also a way to, to preserving this work is also a way to show the other face of migration. It's not always this. And um, so for us, it's really important to, to preserve, preserve our work. Um, and about access, I think giving people access, uh, if it, even if it's digital, um, it's always to keep a way, like it's, it's a way to keep our doors open, open to, to the community and, 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 and also a way to humanize migration for everyone. Thank you for that. And I will say as a as a historian, I'm a trained historian, uh, that's what my PhD is. And after I was working as a journalist, got my PhD in history. And I will just say from a historian's perspective, creating these archives is, is essential for future historical work. And so I, we've been trying to figure this out in terms of, well, what does this look like in a digital world? And so this is an opportunity, I think, and I have to commend um, the libraries, Confluence Center, and all those people who are helping to make these archives possible for future research. So um, we have some questions now from the audience. And the first question, I think that you have all touched on a, a little bit, but maybe you have something else to add. And that question is, uh, what are some of the misconceptions about desert biomes and how does this affect border communities? And let's see, who would like to, to go first? Maybe I'll just call on Josue. Desert, we are subtropic in the room. Um, but I think maybe Michelle right. uh, would be a better. I, uh... I guess I think what the the question would be in general your particular area of of the uh, Mexico U.S. borderlands. Yeah, I mean for us, um, you know, I think the valley and the region has had a long history of this narrative that my friend Nancy Guevara, who's an artist uh, locally, has been exploring around no hay nada aquí, or you know, like that there's nothing of value from where where we are. Um, um, there's also narratives that are pushed around the border being a frontier for exploration, um, not only uh, of the state's ideology, but also of, you know, systems that maintain the world, like I mentioned SpaceX, right? And so they're literally extracting the value and everything that we have in the border to for capitalism. And so um, I think that uh, the deserts that we're seeing and the myths 
that we're seeing about there not being anything here, right? And about um, it being a, a frontier for exploration and for um, that really needs to be, um, you know, taken care of or guarded is something that I think regionally we've been dealing with for a long time <laughs> and um it's taken its way in in more contemporary ways um and it looks different but uh you know whether it be farming cattle ranching <laughs> and whatever it is now the space industry right there's always this idea that um what is there is not worth anything so we need to go and make it better or we but when in reality we know why they're here and that's to extract our resources and to continuously utilize our labor and our position um for for their political benefits and so i think that's uh what i would have to say about that but yeah Thanks. I was just, for folks who aren't familiar with the issue of SpaceX and the RGV, can you explain what's going on there? Sure. So SpaceX Boca Chica Beach has become um, the second site for the SpaceX launch uh, site, basically. Um, but it's a space that is historically known as the uh, People's Beach. Um, it's the only open access beach in Brownsville, and it's a home to endangered animals in, or in, in addition to being a sacred site for the uh, Carrizo Comet Crudo Estocna um, uh, tribe here in, in the Rio Grande Valley. And so it's um, literally <laughs> the face of capitalism, the richest person in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, making this his, uh, or in the world, making the Rio Grande Valley his um, play area. <laughs> Thank you. And Sara, Michelle, you want to add anything that you haven't said any um, so far about this question of misconceptions in desert, desert or the biomes in which you're working and how it's affecting communities? Well, we don't have much desert, but um, um, I think one of the misconceptions about uh, the border, especially in Tijuana, it's like it's often um, it's, it has been seen more like a way to access to the developed world, to like to cross to the United States. And in my experience, Tijuana, it's always seen like a, um, a city, a city for tourists, for, uh, especially for U.S. citizens. So, and, and that has been changing a little bit, but it's, uh, Tijuana is being seen like a very dangerous place but also like a place for tourists and for US citizens and it's much it's the border in Tijuana it's unique it has a mixture of cultures and now languages it's like no other place I've been in other cities uh, in Mexico and, and also in the US and Tijuana has this unique vibe. I mean, it, also in the border cities, for example, in, in El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, it's it's really unique. It's really different than other parts of the U.S. and, and Mexico. So, and this has to be um, highlighted too. And I think it's also important to understand why we are, why the border is like this. And most of this is because of the consequences of the migratory policies and the and the uh, and the actions of both governments. Thank you. How about you, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, in terms of I just obviously I agree with what the you know two before me had said. Um the first thing that really comes to mind is basically the misconceptions that deserts are barren and in the work that we do within the food system, a term like food desert just perpetuates that misconception. And that's something I think we really challenge. Unfortunately, food deserts as a term is used so widespread in terms of so many different areas of food justice to this day. And we we agree with, um, well, Carrie, Karen Washington coined the term food apartheid, that that's really what's happening in food deserts. If they're not food deserts, it's, it's food apartheid, which is an intentional, um, phenomenon, basically, in terms of folks not having access to um, healthy foods, fresh foods, spaces to grow food. But I think what comes to mind, too, in terms of challenging that misconception and the language that we use, and especially something like food desert, 
is what a lot of people don't know. And I think sometimes it's almost a, a willful ignorance about the regions where we live and especially desert regions. They're incredibly you know, diverse. I know the Chihuahuan Desert is, I think, if not the, it's one of the most biodiverse uh, deserts or regions in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and there's lessons to be learned. You know, unfortunately, these mis misconceptions create barriers to these lessons. And if you really understand and reconnect and connect yourself to native plants, they're the ones in the wildlife that have the lessons in terms of contending with climate change and are true examples of resilience. Again, I know that sounds probably fairly romantic, but it's incredibly scientific <laughs> as well. So I think for us, it's acknowledging those misconceptions, naming them, but also addressing them in various ways and taking the lead from the actual ecosystem and the wildlife that we, we co-inhabit in this area. So there's a lot more I would want to say about that because of the work we do, but I wanted to name that for sure. That's that's great. And a lot of people talk about news deserts, and I feel the same way about the way that term gets thrown around, too. And that made me think of I've never heard people talk about news apartheid. So maybe that's um, some direction that we need to maybe be thinking about. I think we only probably have time for maybe one more question. We have such great questions, but I'm I think this is a, I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to get to probably all of the questions, but for, for all of the panelists here, there's this, I think, great question for people who are in the audience. What advice would you give to archivists and other community organizers in the borderlands who wanna engage in arts and culture to build power in their communities? And maybe we can start with uh, Sada on this one. That's a very important question. Well, I think for um in our experience, one of the best ways that we that we do to in order to to get close to the community, it has been through art and culture. So it's always it's I think one of the most important thing. It's always um involve the community in in these processes because um it. it 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 provides um, a richness uh, when there's a, a cultural and in also a community project. So I think in, um, involve the community or involve um, yeah in in this process um, the community. It's it, it's something very important if you want to to address um, something about social justice or like any any injustice so i think it, it it's very important and for us it has been working very well thank you how about for you josue what advice would you give for somebody who's interested in building power in communities through archiving um well, I would say come on down to like the events and to like the uh, the 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 gatherings that are being hosted, so you can see firsthand, right, um, the value that these types of activities bring to the community, and to to bridge that gap that I think um, is is you know there in terms of um, archiving and and storing you know things that are important to the community that don't necessarily fit the uh, what we think of that uh, uh things that are worth enough to to, to save and to, to hold on to so i would say just like um you know and also like being understandable like accessibility right and um how they can facilitate some of these processes for archival so that there aren't as many barriers to and you know for people to step into it or for organizations to know that hey what you're doing is worth archiving, you should probably save it and have uh, something in, in mind for um, sharing this because there's a lot of op um, a lot of lessons that can be learned, um, if not by us currently in the present, by maybe future generations. Um, and there's no reason why folks have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so just like keeping your foot in the elevator for folks to, you know, join the social movement movement, like... <laughs> and go up, then let's do that, so. 
Thanks for that. How about you, Michelle? I would, I would definitely agree with what Sada was saying about always involving the community. Um, we, at least at La Semilla, we really take a community-based approach and a bottom-up approach um, as a, or ground-up approach as opposed to top-down. Um, me personally, I think humility is always critical in any kind of time you're entering, any kind of relationship. Um, and sometimes that's difficult and it takes really true dialogue um, in terms of finding out where folks are at. And so I think what comes to mind as well is, you know, being involved with whoever is part of this, the community, um, really asking what they're already doing. A lot of communities are already doing this kind of work in some form or another. Um, and if you're coming from like kind of an, an outsider perspective, um, I think acknowledging that and having those conversations, as well as thinking, you know, long and hard about audience and, you know, as you're collaborating um, in terms of these kinds of archival and preservation projects, really asking who, you know, folks want to preserve these histories for and who you know, they want to share it out to. Um, I just think that's really critical at the very onset of any kind of collaboration. Um, in terms of, I think, community-based work and, you know, I think about, you know, academia and, and you know, research and that kind of those kinds of collaborations too. Just in my own experience, I also think it's important to really reflect and think about um, whether certain groups have distrust for folks wanting to archive their work. I mean, I think there's a lot of long histories of unfortunate um, representation and for, you know, really not terribly a respectful kind of approach of work too, don't get me wrong, but I've definitely observed that and, and, and seen it. So. I just think all those are kind of critical. And I think, you know, like like everyone's already spoken about it really is a process. And I think it comes down to humility and engaging in that that dialogue and taking that time. Yeah. Such a great um, last point because it just reminded me of a recent talk that I had been to where they were talking about the importance of archiving and creating data, but not all of that data has to be shared with everyone. Okay. And it's something to think about. And anyway, I wanna just thank everybody for all of your work again. Thank you, Celeste. Um, I know that Sara, someone had sent a question specifically for Sara and I wanted to give her a chance to, to respond directly. Um, it was specifically asking if there uh, programs of consciousness raising that are that they have that are meant for the uh, community in Tijuana specifically uh, and I also saw that Josue unmuted I don't know if you had like a final thought to share Josue before we close um I have a question should I respond the question here um live or I just type the the question but I don't well, know if you have it typed that's fine too uh okay well i can i can just say it briefly yeah with the cultural events that's one way that we can um create awareness in the community but also we we organize uh panels and other um like spaces or create spaces where the migrant community can talk about their experiences or from their experiences and in that way, we can also create a dialogue with the community in Tijuana or in San Diego so they can learn, but also to exchange ideas or um, comments about what is happening in, in, in the border. So I think one, one, that's one of the way. And the other way, it's like we do a lot of activities with universities or schools in Tijuana. So that's another way to create awareness in the um, in, in, in in that in that field in, in with the students and and the universities here thank you sada did any of you have any other final thoughts thank you for your time awesome thank you everyone thank you so much uh to our moderator to dr celes gonzalez de bustamante to our panelists Thank you to all of the colleagues at University of Arizona who made this possible. And um, yeah, we, we thank everyone for attending this event, for 
uh, coming out today and we invite you to stay in touch, to reach out. The purpose of this event is really to generate dialogue and spark new connections. And so uh, we hope that, that that this was generative for you. And um, we do ask when you close your Zoom, uh, a pop-up, I think you'll see a pop-up asking you to fill out a survey. We'd really appreciate it if you took uh, just a couple minutes to fill that out to help us um, inform our future programming. And other than that, thank you so much. Have a thank wonderful you. Of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the Zoom. Um, I'll see the rest of you in our debrief Zoom in a second. Bye.